White House 96 Sunday on C-SPAN, the companion network of C-SPAN 2, at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and 9.30 p.m. Pacific Time. Earlier this month, the Muslim Public Affairs Council held a forum entitled Islam Beyond the Stereotypes. This conference held in Los Angeles brought Islamic leaders from around the nation together to discuss such topics as human rights in Islam, the role of women in the Islamic world, and the conflict in Bosnia. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's seminar, Islam Beyond the Stereotypes. My name is Salam al mariadi the director of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. The purpose of the council is to disseminate accurate information about Islam and Muslims to the American public. First of all, I want to thank the American Muslim Institute for, for providing us the grant to make this forum possible. We'd like to begin with some opening remarks. We have with us today Eugene Mornell, who is the Executive Director of the Commission on Human Relations for Los Angeles County. The Commission issues an annual report on hate crimes, which exposes the degree of severity that racism is inflicting on our society. Mr. Mornell's department also holds a luncheon every year, the John Anson Award Ceremony, to honor those who promote positive human relations. The Human Relations Commission, and Jean Mornell in particular, has been invaluable to our council and the Muslim community in providing a healthy platform and to deliver our message of cooperation and coexistence. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eugene Mornell. Thank you, Salam. On behalf of the Human Relations Commission, I'd like to welcome you all here. I've thrown away my 20-minute speech because I promised Salam that I would provide a three-minute welcome. <laughs> um, the Commission has been very much concerned not only with hate crime, not only with stereotyping, and all the negative aspects of relationships among groups in Los Angeles County, but also with the positive aspects of intergroup understanding. We are concerned particularly with what happens to people here in this county with Muslims in Los Angeles County as opposed to what is happening around the world. Not that we are not interested in those events, but our focus is here in this county. And while we understand that what's happening abroad affects all of us here, our concern is that we here in this country, in this county, begin to dispel the stereotypes, begin to understand each other. We therefore have to look not only at Muslims, not only at Jews, but also at Serbs, at Croatians, at all groups living among us who hopefully are trying to work toward the same goals of better understanding. We hope that this seminar certainly will begin to dispel some of those myths about Islam, provide you with a better understanding, and perhaps during the discussion develop an ongoing dialogue among the many of us here who come from many different groups in our understanding of Islam and Muslims here in the county. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. We have a very culturally diverse crowd with us today as well. We have members of the Jewish community with us, Christians. I believe there is a member of the Serbian Relations Cooperations Committee here with us. We welcome him here. And we have representatives from political offices and representatives of the media who are coming here as well. As a matter of fact, we even have someone from the FBI here to learn about Islam. So for a change, it's nice to know which one of you is from the FBI. <laughs> In opening our seminar, we want to emphasize that we are approaching a critical crossroad in American pluralism. We must decide which camp to which we belong 
vis-a-vis -vis Islam in America? Are we among the educated? Are we among the unaware bystanders? Or are we among those who deliberately defame Islam? And we must also avoid the self-fulfilling prophecy about Muslims. That is, we hear in the media and in so many other quarters of policy making that these Muslims, they are dangerous and cannot respect human rights. And then we see Muslims resenting these statements and resent us for saying those statements. Then we hear, see how anti-American and anti-West they are. In short, we have to move beyond the us versus them mentality. In reality, there is no us and there is no them. There are those who are stupid and those who are smart. There are those who are oppressors and those who are the oppressed. There are those who are free thinkers and those who are conformists. Our decisions today will have a direct and significant impact on our children's society, whether it becomes one of animosity or one of peace, the way God desires. Furthermore, how can American Muslims who are sworn to uphold the Constitution and fundamentally be American practice Islam? We will discuss these and many other important questions in this seminar, Islam Beyond the Stereotypes. And so now, to get a closer look at Muslims and their activities, let us ask our first group of panelists to come up to the front stage and be seated. And I will introduce to you the first panelist who will speak. This session is entitled, A Look at Muslims. Our first speaker is Summer Hatut. She is a Juris Doctorate who recently graduated from UCLA School of Law. During law school, she interned for the ACLU doing research on human rights abuses in Argentina and the Philippines. And she also worked for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office as a law clerk. Summer is the president of the Muslim Women's League and a participant in the Women's Coalition Against Ethnic Cleansing. Last March, Summer and five other members of the coalition traveled to Croatia and met with various organizations to determine how those who have suffered are being provided services. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the dynamic leader of the Muslim Women's League and a rising star in the peace and justice community, Mrs. Summer Hatut. Good morning. Oppressed, veiled, uneducated, worthless. These are the images that come to mind when we think of Muslim women. How can the words Muslim woman conjure up such hopelessness? The perceptions and stereotypes of Muslim women are based primarily on two factors. First, the actual traditions of some, but by no means all, countries that are predominantly Muslim. Second, our own biases and ethnocentrism when looking at people different from ourselves. As to the first point, women are oppressed and relegated to being chattel in many parts of the world. The oppression of women is based on customs and tradition, not religion. Along with ignorance of the religion was the desire of the powerful to use all possible means to oppress not only women, but anyone who would challenge their authority. The means used can take many forms, from physical coercion to the manipulation of religious doctrine and the convolution of religion with custom. It is not the word of God that oppressed Muslim women. Rather, it has been the ignorance and the resistance of the ruling elite to obey those words. As to the second point, our own biases. We have a tendency to think that anything that deviates from our ways or from our dress is by definition bizarre 
or weird. However, oppression takes many forms. Some countries compel women to, unco to cover, excuse me. Our society compels women to uncover. Women are exploited by everyone, from Hollywood to Budweiser. In fact, for a woman to cover her body when done by her own will is an act of liberation. She is saying that she is to be valued for traits more meaningful than mere physical attributes. Now that we've looked at the stereotypes and at their origins, let's look at reality. We in fact have two realities, actual life and the word of God as revealed in the Quran and embodied in the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. First, we'll consider actual life. Women are not oppressed in every country that claims to be Muslim. In Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia, Malaysia, and Indonesia, women are accorded rights equal to those of men. We have a tendency when we discuss the plight of Muslim women to focus only on Saudi Arabia and on the Gulf. But to look only at Saudi Arabia does not provide an adequate sample from which to draw conclusions. There are seven countries in the world that are actually run by women. Two of these are Bangladesh and Turkey. And until recently, Pakistan was among them. While seven out of the 100 and some countries is indeed a shameful and appalling statistic, for two of those seven to be, to be Muslim countries should go a long way to challenge the stereotypes we have about Muslims and Muslim women. And a statistic that surprises many, there are more women in the Iranian parliament than there are in the United States Senate. Aside from running countries, Muslim women all over the world take an active part in their societies. Whether she is a teacher in Morocco, a soldier in Bosnia, or a doctor in the United States, the reality of most Muslim women is a viable and valuable existence. As to the role of American Muslim women, we are to work with all Muslims to clarify Islam so that it cannot be used as a tool of oppression by anyone. With regard to non-Muslims in general, and women in particular, we should explore the true meanings of liberation, decency, equality, and respect between the sexes to help alleviate the exploitation of all women. Our second reality to consider is that of the text, the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad. These are the supreme sources of law in Islam. The Quran was revealed to Muhammad who lived in a tribal, classist, and sexist Arabia. Islam guaranteed women the right to vote, a right which unfortunately my American sisters only got about 70 years ago. Islam also guaranteed to women the right to own property, the right to inherit, to marry whom she chose, to keep her maiden name, to be educated, to work, and to make decisions on a par equal to men. And these teachings did not exist only in theory. They were actually implemented in the early days of Islam. In essence, Islam gave the women of Arabia life a freedom and recognition as persons that had been unheard of. These sweeping changes were resisted by the men of ancient Arabia, much as they are resisted by the men of today. In short, Islam broke the shackles that accompanied womanhood. To conclude, to say that Islam has hindered women is to misunderstand the teachings of God and Muhammad, and it is to fall prey to those who seek to use religion for their own material advantage. And I realized that my time on this subject was very brief, but we wanted to use some of the segment that I was given to discuss one of the projects of the Muslim Women's League, which is the Women's Coalition Against Ethnic Cleansing, 
a coalition that was formed last December by the Muslim Women's League, the American Jewish Congress, and the Sisters of Charity of the Los Angeles Catholic Archdiocese, and which now consists of about 20 groups. The coalition was formed in response to the rape of Bosnian women. And I would like to introduce Dr. Lena El Saraf, who was a board member of the Muslim Women's League and the head of the political lobbying and media committee of the coalition. Thank you, Summer. Good morning. On behalf of the Muslim Women's League and the Co Women's Coalition Against Ethnic Cleansing, I will give an update on the situation in Bosnia. We, members of the League and the Coalition, thought it important to designate a segment of this seminar to the struggle in Bosnia. We feel that the relative silence of the world in the face of the continued aggression of Bosnian Serbs is reflective of the ignorance of Muslims and Islam. The characterization of Muslims as fanatics and barbaric appears to allow the de-evaluation of Muslim human lives and makes this massacre more acceptable. In other words, this genocide is being perpetuated indirectly through negative propaganda against Muslims. We feel that if it had been misguided Muslims who were the aggressors, surely the world would have reacted in a different manner. The images of Muslims portrayed in the media delineate terrorists who have no value for any human life. In fact, it would be contrary to the teachings of the Quran, our holy book, to justify any such attitude or behavior. The Quran cherishes human life and states in one of its verses, if anyone kills a person for any reason other than for the killing of a person or for sowing corruption in the land, it will be as if he had killed the whole of mankind. The Quran favors a peaceful means to settle conflicts, but in instances when the dignity of a person or his personal property are threatened, the person has the right to defend him or herself. In the following verse, the Quran reveals, Permission to fight is given to those whom war is being wrongfully waged, and verily, God has indeed the power to succor them. Those who have been driven from their homelands against all rights for no other reason than their saying, Our sustainer is God. For if God had not enabled people to defend themselves against one another, all monasteries and churches and synagogues and mosques, in all, of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in all of which God's name is abundantly extolled, would surely have been destroyed. Bosnia was, a symbol of, was symbolic of an atmosphere of tolerance and harmony with its multi-ethnic makeup, an attitude fostered by Islam. The Quran, in the Quran, God says he has made people into nations and tribes for us to get to know one another. The Muslim Women's League, along with the American Jewish Congress and the Sisters of Charity of the Los Angeles Archdiocese, have, uh, had established the Women's Coalition Against Ethnic Cleansing in December of 92. Since then, the coalition has expanded and is currently affiliated with approximately 20 other organizations. The coalition has concentrated on both relief and political lobbying to address this crisis. To better help the Bosnian people, the coalition sent a delegation of six members to Zagreb, Croatia on a fact-finding mission. It was thought that this was mainly a women's issue, but when the members returned, they felt it was much more. Not only were the women suffering, but the men and children were just as much victims of this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> victims of this war. As a coalition, we have been politically active and in contact with our California representatives. To date, there have been two resolutions, House Resolution 24 and 35, and a bill, number 1044. House Resolution 24, 24 was sponsored by Congressman Moran and deals with the lifting of the arms embargo. House Resolution 35, with its corresponding resolution in the Senate, Senate Resolution 11, also calls for the lifting of the arms embargo, as well as limited airstrikes. These resolutions were sponsored by Congressman Hoyer and Senator DeConcini, respectively. The bill sponsored by Senator Dole also calls for the termination of the embargo. 
Recently, Senator Di Cansini addressed an open letter to the President in response to the siege in Sarajevo. The letter called for the withdrawal of the Bosnian Serb positions around Sarajevo and a bombing of these positions, positions if there was no withdrawal within 72 hours. The coalition has asked both Senator Boxer and Feinstein to take a firm stand against the ongoing atrocities. We had asked them to sponsor the resolution, the bill, as well as the open letter to the President. To date, Senator Feinstein is in favor of limited airstrikes. She spoke on the Senate floor in April of 93 condemning the aggression. She had also published one of our letters in the Congressional Record. Senator Boxer so far has not wavered on her position to lift the arms embargo or initiate any military intervention. In the United States, we have heard many stories of the tragedies taking place in Bosnia on the news, but not until recently have we had any direct contact with these victims of war. A couple of months ago, a victim had been sponsored by a family here in California for an eye operation. Nineteen victims within the last two weeks arrived here for treatment at various hospitals. While the humanitarian gestures are commendable, they barely scratch the surface of what is needed as a result of our prolonged inaction. It is estimated that two to three children die per day just in Sarajevo alone, according to the World Health Organization. We have seen in the past year and a half three courageous men from the State Department take action to denounce the status quo policy towards Bosnia. George Kenney, Marshall Harris, and John Western have resigned from their positions because of the, their belief that the United States was not doing enough to stop the war in Bosnia. The consequences of this war are not limited to Bosnia. It is a threat to the ability of humanity to live in peace and harmony. The outcome of the peace negotiations is significant because it will set the precedence of a possible new world order based on intolerance. To quote President Clinton, I think we have an interest in standing up against the principle of ethnic cleansing. If you look at the turmoil all through the Balkans, if you look at other places where this could play itself out in other parts of the world, this is not just about Bosnia. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to acknowledge a special guest who has just arrived. He has sponsored a number, a number of resolutions in the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors on Bosnia uh, and on a number of other issues that are important to all American citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, Supervisor Mike Antonovich, and he's here on his birthday as well. Also with us today, a distinguished uh, member of uh, government. He's the mayor of Azusa, and he's running for the state senate, Mayor Eugene Moses. Mayor Moses. We now want to look at a demographic survey of American Muslims. And this discussion will be presented by Dr. Aslam Abdullah, who is the editor-in-chief of the Minaret Magazine, an Islamic magazine distributed nationally. He studied sociology and journalism in London from where he completed his PhD. He was an editorial staff member of the Islamic World Review, published also in London. He taught journalism at the American Islamic College in Chicago before joining the Minaret. He has authored several books on Muslims in South Asia and recently appeared in a Los Angeles Times article on U.S. Muslims are part of the American fabric. Dr. Abdullah. Thank you very much, Salam. Happy birthday, Supervisor. <laughs> uh, who are these Muslims? Where did they come? What is their population? When these questions are asked by the scholars of history and the students of political science, one begins to wonder how little is known about a community whose demography is rooted in the history of the country itself. I'll have to take it out. So I was saying that one begins to wonder how little is known about a community whose demography is rooted in the history of the country. And by the history, I don't mean 
to describe the voyage of those eight Muslims who crossed Atlantic before Columbus, but by history, I mean of those early European Muslims who came to the United States once they were expelled from Spain after the 1492 Inquisition. It was a wave of more than 300,000 people who came to the Iberian Peninsula and many of them found their way in, the, in what is known as the United States. And how did they find their way? The same way as Columbus found their way. It was the book of Idrisi, a famous geographer of the 15th century, that Columbus landed at the shores of the United States together with the Bible. It was known as the Sea of the Darkness. That was one of the most popular books at that time. That was about geography, about sea voyages, and many Muslims who were exiled from Spain had access to those kind of books, and they landed in the United States at that particular time. They developed their own poetry, their own culture. In fact, many of them brought uh, hand-produced uh, news sheets, and produced uh, copies of their holy scriptures and other kind of things. And the survivors of them may still be found in certain parts of the United States, although not very vocal, not very dominant. Like any other persecuted community in the Europe at that time, they found a home in the United States. Then came a second wave of Muslims, not they wrote through their own will, but they were brought in chains and they were Africans from West Africa. Many of them were coerced to change their faith. Many of them were tortured to death, but many of them survived. And how did they survive? They had no access to writings, they had no access to pen and paper. They wrote on walls whatever they could remember from their scriptures. And two of these important sentences which they passed on to their generations were remarkable. Those two sentences were, glory belongs to God and peace comes from God. So if you look at the literature of African Muslims, you would find that these two words regularly and commonly mentioned throughout their literature in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. Then something else happened in 1777. This country became independent. We uh, fought against British. And the first country that recognized our independence was Morocco. And from 1777 until 1787, when the first treaty this country signed, a treaty of friendship and cooperation with Morocco, a large number of Muslims from West, from North Africa, landed on the shores of the country, greeting the freedom and greeting the liber liberty of this country. And they are, their survivors are still here. Then, another interesting thing happened in 1865. What happened that the a sculptor who designed the Statue of Liberty, and his name was August Bartholdi, he visited Egypt in 1865. And there, together with other Egyptian Muslim sculptors, he visited Abu Simbel and many other historical places. And he conceived the idea of a statue that, needs, that he wanted to be erected at Suez Canal, similar to that of the Statue of Liberty. And he gave that idea to Ismail Pasha, who was the governor of Egypt at that particular time. But Ismail Pasha could not come up with the money and the idea of erecting that statue that was to be known as Egypt carrying the light of Asia. Exactly the same as you see in the Statue of Liberty. But the idea was not carried out. So uh, he then sold the idea to uh, Labudi and Labole, who in fact took the idea to the government of the United States at that particular time. Now if you look at the demography of Muslims, we find that 56% of the Muslims today are the descendants of the Muslims from 1516 until 1900 or the 20th century. Only 44% of the Muslims who are here today came after, 90, after the First World War. And among them, approximately 20 or 25% came after 1960. Out of these so-called six to eight million Muslims, the largest numbers of Muslims come from the African-American group, 44% of them. 
Then the next number is 24% that comes from South Asian background. Then the Arabs, 12.4%. And then we have Muslims of European stock, approximately 5%. Africans, that includes North Africa and South Africa, approximately 6%. And Iranians and Turks and Southeast Asian, that includes Japanese and Koreans and uh, Malaysians and Indonesians, making approximately 12% of the Muslims. But the bulk of the Muslims who are here are the Muslims who are the descendants of the Muslims, earlier European Muslims and earlier African Muslims. Then we look at the, their settlements. And you'd find that the largest number of Muslims is here in southern in California. More than a million Muslims are in California. The second largest uh, Muslim population is concentrated in New York, approximately uh, two-thirds of a million. And then we have in Illinois, in New Jersey, in Indiana, in Michigan, in Virginia, Ohio, and Maryland, and Texas, where Muslims are largely concentrated and, 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 and doing well. Then, if you look also at the demography, that is the age profile of the Muslims, you would also, we will also notice that approximately 30% of the Muslims are under the age of 15. And these are the Muslims that definitely uh, you know, are part of the, 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 the social and political structure of the country, and they are participating in uh, all the spheres of the country, in all the spheres of, 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 of uh, the social political life in the country. So from this brief description, the image that uh, we often are projected is that the Muslims are an alien people who came after the oil boom in 1973, that image needs to be dispelled because that is not either true, not historically right. At the end, I would like to end with a quote that uh, I always admire and was uh, uh, written by a person whom I identify and whom I take as my role model. It was written by Alexander Russell Webb. He was the editor of the Missouri Gazette and he was the first uh, uh, diplomatic counsel to the Philippines. In 1893, Alexander Russell Webb represented Islam in the first parliament of world religion that took place in Chicago. And this is what he said, and I would end my talk on, the, on his quote. I am an American of the Americas. I carried with them the same errors that thousands of Americans carry with them today. Those errors have grown into history, false history has influenced our opinion of Islam. It influenced my opinion of Islam, and when I began 10 years ago to study the Oriental religions, I threw Islam aside as altogether too corrupt for consideration. But when I came to go beneath the surface to know what Islam really is, to know who and what the Prophet of Arabia was, I changed my belief very materially, and I am proud to say that I am now a Muslim. I have not returned from the Philippines to the United States to make you all Muslims in spite of yourselves. I never intended to do it in the world. I do not propose to take a sword in one hand and the Quran in the other hand and go through the world killing every man who does not say there is no God but one and Muhammad is the prophet of God. But I have faith in the American intellect, in the American intelligence, and the American love of fair play and will defy any intelligent man to understand Islam and not love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we'll take some questions and provide some answers. You may give your questions to the ushers and they'll bring them up forward. First question for Dr. Abdullah. What kinds of American Muslims have contributed to American society? And who are they? You want me to go to the recent history or the ancient history of the United States? If we are talking about the recent history, how many of you have visited Sears Towers in Chicago? How many of you have visited Sears Towers in Chicago? The man who designed and who originated the idea, his name was Fadlur Rahman, and he was from Bangladesh, who was settled here, who died here, and who is buried in Chicago. That tunnel, New York tunnel that we often hear that was supposed to be blown up by eight uh, so-called Muslims, that was designed by a Turk. 
the in the scientific area also in the uh, the United States communication agency is represented by a Muslim and one can enlist a number of Muslims who have made their contributions in sociology in science in arts uh, in fact uh, uh, in 1985, this movie, uh, what, what was it called? Ahmed, yes, Ahmed Amadeus. That, the, the, the man who won the Oscar for that movie, his name was Farid Morah Ibrahim. And he was, his, his, his forefathers came from the Middle East. Uh, also, uh, one of the well-known American Muslim women, and her name was Dr. Jabara. She was instrumental in uh, designing and uh, building up the King Faisal Eye Hospital in Saudi Arabia, which is called the best eye hospital in the world. So one can go on and on enlisting those Muslims. And also in the past, also, if you look at the literature of Muslims that was produced, whether in poetry or in prose or in political science, you would find a number of Muslims who are distinguished by their contributions to the U.S. Muslim life. Okay, this is a question for Summer, Hatut, and Lena. Does Islam have a position on family planning? Islam, Islam does not prohibit uh, family planning. It does not prohibit the use of contraception. And it was practiced in its more primitive forms during the time of Prophet Muhammad. Do you want to add okay. Question for Dr. Abdullah. It appears to me that Muslims, Jews, and Christians are natural allies. Would it not be in the interest of Muslims to join forces with Jews and Christians on other issues? Could not the leaders approach the Jewish and Christian leaders to develop this joint? I like to put that question the other way around. Why don't the Christians and Jews join Muslims in their struggle for freedom and justice, not only in here, but in other parts of the world? Everywhere in the world, they are fighting for justice and peace in their own lands. Uh, uh, in Central Asia, they have, they have been doing that for the last uh, 70 years. Uh, we have not heard of those heroes, unsung heroes, who died in prison, Mustafa, J Mustafa Jamiluf who languished in prison for almost 40 years, and then he died, and nobody knows about his name. So we would like Christians and Jews to join the hands for Muslims in their struggle for freedom and justice in their own countries. And as far as their Muslims and Jews and Christians in this country is concerned, they are involved in a long and uh, continued dialogue on all the fronts, whether social, political, or religious. Question to Summer Hatu. What is the attitude of the Muslim Women's League towards sex education, birth control, and abortion? The Muslim Women's League, as a Muslim organization, of course, follows the teachings of Islam. As I just mentioned in answering the previous question, the position of Islam is not against birth control. And in the same vein, uh, sex education is something that should be taught. Again, this was something that did come up quite often during the time of Muhammad, and there are numerous teachings of Muhammad on sex education. As to abortion, that is a bit uh, trickier of an issue. There is a debate among Muslim scholars. Many Muslims prohibit it completely. Others allow it within a very restricted time frame. The Muslim Women's League has not formulated an official position on the issue of abortion. Aslam, hate crimes are not committed by the kinds of people who are here, nor by the average hardworking individuals. How can we contain the criminals who, per who perpetrate these crimes? If the people who are here make it their job to see that wherever they are in their neighborhoods, in their schools, in their colleges, in their institutions, impart the message that Islam is uh, as equal as Judaism and Christianity and as monotheistic as Judaism and Christianity and as uh, caring about humanity as any other religion, probably things would change. Uh, when we start uh, uh, 
controlling ourselves of a vocabulary and describing Islam uh, as people, Islamic terrorists, as Islamic fundamentalists, militants. We were in control of our vocabulary. When we would uh, start uh, uh, dialoguing with Muslims, when we start identifying with Muslims and their struggles, wherever it is, probably things would improve because when they would see the leaders of the community identifying and coming closer to the Muslim community, it would definitely have an effect on the society as a whole as well. Dr. Saraf, what are the Islamic nations doing to help their Islamic neighbors in Bosnia? That's a good question. Um, basically, we have been in contact with some of the Islamic nations, and we've asked uh, what they have been doing. Uh, our, their response has been they have been helping in terms of financial aid, as well as uh, urging the UN to lift the arms embargo. We also are um, pressuring them to do more, much more than that. I, I just want to add, there is no such thing as Islamic nations. Countries in the Middle East do not represent Islam. They oppress their own Muslims. And therefore, we in the Muslim Public Affairs Council have no confidence in them. We are asking the international leaders to take action. And if anything, we've condemned the activities of these countries who oppress their own people in the name of Islam. Summer. Do American Muslim women suffer any backlash within the greater Muslim community as they strive to override the culture that misinterprets the Quran? And cultures in quotes. American Muslim women, just as all women, whether they're non-Muslim or not, do face a backlash always from the from their oppressors American Muslim women do suffer to a certain extent a backlash there is hostility there is always in any society the desire to maintain the status quo but we are struggling to to uphold the teachings of Islam and backlash or not will we will keep struggling to educate Muslims and non-Muslims as to the true teachings of Islam. I think we have, um, just in any, as in any religion, we have the Muslims that are educated and know their religion and those that are not. And I think that male chauvinism know, know, knows no boundaries in terms of culture or religion. And uh, we, like uh, uh, the other women of uh, different religions, are struggling um, for our liberation. In my home, the backlash is just the opposite. <laughs> so I'm a good Muslim. <laughs> Islam in America is very diverse. What efforts are you engaged in to bring these diff to bridge these differences, Dr. Abdullah? Islam is not diverse. Muslims are diverse. They come from various ethnic groups and various ethnic uh, backgrounds. And uh, the things that have kept these people together throughout the ages and throughout the centuries is their common belief that, the, that they have an ultimate power to, to rely on and they have a message that they have to carry on in their life and they have to impart it to others. That was evident in the first uh, wave of Muslim, uh, European Muslims who came from Spain and then subsequently African American Muslims and then uh, Muslims from North Africa and other parts of the world carried on that kind of thing. That their monotheistic, strong monotheistic belief and their assertion that in the, wherever they are, it is their responsibility to give to their country the best that they can, to, the, to make the contribution, the best possible contribution they can make as human beings to the country in which they live. So uh, the diversity is in the ethnicity, not, in the not at the conceptual level, not at the level of ideas. And when there exists some kind of diversity that is also within the framework of the monotheism, not outside the framework of monotheism. Uh, back to you again, Aslam. Has the influx of the Elijah Muhammad Malcolm X followers changed the face of the American Muslim community? No, not at all. In fact, uh, uh, the African American community, like uh, 
uh, rest of the Muslim community is also diverse. Many of them came from West, West Africa, some of them are from North Africa, some of them are from East Africa. And uh, uh, the, the, it, it so happened that one particular community was swayed by one kind of uh, political ideology at one particular time. Of time. But the sooner they realized the futility of that political ideology, they immediately found solace in the, the, the monotheistic ideas and, the, and their original conceptual uh, framework. Okay. Summer, if, as the panelists suggest, the Quran decrees equality and freedom for women and others, why is it that there is no democratic country among any of those that have dominant Muslim majorities? This is a question really for the next session, but we wanted to hear a response from the Muslim Women's League, and this question is being given by Jack Salem of the Jewish Federation. The reason is not only do those countries that claim to be Muslim or that are predominantly Muslim, they oppress women, they oppress men, they oppress everyone. The leaders of those countries are in it for their own political advantage. They do not care about the masses and they are not following the teachings of Islam. Islam decrees very clearly democracy and equality for all people. I also want to point out that there was an experiment in Algeria where democracy could have won, but the military dictators decided not to have the Muslims who had the political party and who had enough votes um, to let the elections go forward. So that election was aborted, there was a chance for democracy, another chance in the history uh, and unfortunately in the negative legacy of East-West relations. Um, so there are experiments that we may not be aware of, but they're being aborted for one reason or another. Thank you very much for this first panel, uh, our speakers, to give uh, excellent presentations and answering the questions. Not all the questions were answered, of course, but we will have these questions in the Minaret magazine of our next issue and answer all the ones that we were not able to do so uh, today. I'd like to ask uh, our next speaker to come up to the podium and to begin. <laughs> We have a, a real treat today because we are privileged to have Dr. Abu El Fadl with us today who has a busy lecture schedule at several universities in California and fortunately he was kind enough to accept an invitation to speak on an important topic, human rights and democracy in Islam. Dr. Abu Fadl received his undergraduate degree at Yale and he also received his Juris Doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. He is currently at Princeton University. He has lectured at numerous universities throughout the United States and has written many scholarly articles on Islamic law. Presently, he is the managing editor of the journal published by Princeton University, Princeton Papers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Khaled Abul Fadl. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I think it's an important topic and a very timely issue. <coughs> the issue of human rights and democracy and their compatibility or lack of compatibility with Islam to a large extent is an issue of definition and the power of definition. When one poses a question is Islam compatible with human rights and or democracy? The question in its essence is entirely devoid of meaning. It is a question that is by definition extremely vague. And one often finds that the one who poses the question is assuming a monolithic definition of Islam as well as a monolithic definition of human rights and a monolithic definition of democracy. Those who take the trouble to think more carefully will find that Islam, and perhaps here I would disagree with an earlier speaker, is in fact 
contains within its system a lot of diversity and is a diverse system. And that democracy is an issue of which theory of democracy? We all know, for example, that, the, that for quite a while and even till today, a lot of socialists claimed to be the true embodiment of democracy. And I wish we would get into the habit of being more precise and saying a liberal, secular, American democracy rather just, uh, than just simply democracy or human rights. From my point of view, Islam, as well as any other system of faith or ideology, is an idea, essentially an idea. It is transmitted through a text to humans. In that process, it is subject to interpretation, construction, reinterpretation, as well as deconstruction. Of course, I do not mean to offend Muslims by implying that their religion is um, uh, of such vague nature that it could be defined in any form. But essentially, I have to admit to you that I look at any idea, any ideology, as well as Islam, as an enabling device. To bring the idea a bit closer and without getting into a lot of theoretical sophistication, in my perception it is like an airplane. An airplane has a specific function. Its function is to take people off the earth into the air. Now where you take this airplane, which destination you take your airplane will depend on human agents. Over 1400 years of history, Muslims developed a variety of institutions and concepts. Some of these concepts are extremely egalitarian, shockingly of democratic nature, and um, in many ways liberal. And some other concepts were not so. Some of these concepts, for example, such as the idea that um, a government must be contracted into power. This is what they call the Aqt. Uh, the idea that whoever rules much, must have a contract. Now, we can get into debates whether this contract is a social uh, contract or a legal contract or some other third uh, mutation of contract uh, theory. But that's beside the point. Also, the idea that government must come to power through uh, a vote of confidence, the idea of bay'ah. Now, of course, it did not resemble our modern day of uh, voting system where you fill in a piece of paper and you, or now you, you do it basically through computers. Uh, but the, there was a notion of a vote, uh, often done uh, by someone coming in and reciting certain formula and so on. And the idea that this vote was, in fact, expansively given to many elements in society. But again, how, did the, how was this idea practiced in Islamic history? Varied and very tremendously. As well as the idea that society, family, any community must conduct its affairs through shura or consultation. That there must be a system of consultation, debate, and discussion. But then we get into all the types of complexities. Uh, what form should this take? How binding is it? Also, as well, the idea that every human being on the earth had the duty of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Uh, what Muslims call nahi bil maruf wa nahi anil maruf wa al-amr bil al-amr bil maruf wa nahi anil munkar. I I I uh, I made enjoin the bad and forbid the good. A Freudian slip, I'm sure. Uh, but, and it was, in fact, practiced throughout 1400 years of history in many different forms. Uh, some forms that we would think are rather archaic and bizarre, and some forms that would make sense to us. Again, uh, the idea that 
between the people and the leader should stand a body uh, which Muslims called Ahl al-Hall wal-Aqd or the, the group that loosens and binds. The idea that somehow th this group must represent something to the leader. And then we had a lot of debates whether it represents the people, whether it represents God's law, whether it, pre it represents uh, some philosophical interest. There's a lot of debate on that. And finally, uh, and this is not an exhaustive list, this is just to exemplify the point and emphasize it. The idea that um, uh, what is the principles, legal principles of Islam supposed to serve and surprisingly, definitely surprising to, surprisingly to me, I found a lot of medieval Muslim jurists, and by medieval I mean about 600, 700, 800 years ago, assert that the purpose of uh, what they call the Sharia uh, or Fiqh is to achieve the welfare of the people and to improve the, con the material conditions of people. All these ideas, as uh, Professor Bernard Lewis at Princeton University has identified in a recent article entitled Islam and Democracy, has made Islam one of the most egalitarian systems of thought. Uh, and it, it, the way he actually puts it is that perhaps Islam uh, would be the most prone towards creating a democ democratic system. My problem with that is I'm, I'm comfortable with the word Islam uh, as being prone towards anything. But beside this tradition, um, well, before I get into that, let me just uh, present another clarification. Within the Muslim traditions, the vast Muslim literature that is found, one finds that there is a distinct opposition and resistance literature that arose throughout Islamic history. Opposition and resistance literature means uh, it's a literature that emphasizes the value of resisting oppression or resisting injustice. And as we all know, uh, at the same time that you will open uh, one book and find uh, people attributing to the Prophet of Islam that he said uh, that an, a, a just non-Muslim is always more, um, is always worthier than an unjust Muslim. You find that tradition. You also find another tradition that says um, obey a Muslim regardless of how unjust they are. Now, this is not surprising that these two counter traditions are there. One of resistance, freedom, and so on, and the other of obedience and uh, subservience. In fact, it is not any different from most of the world's history. It definitely not any different from European history, uh, throughout European development. We know that uh, it took the, the countries that were inspired by Christianity about 2,000 years to develop secularism and then develop democracy. In my view, which is a view of a comparativists, uh, there is nothing inevitable in that. It took them 2,000 years. If we want to be entirely mathematical and fair, as Professor Mohsen Mahdi said at Harvard, uh, we should give Islam another 600 years to develop a democratic or secular system. But often, as most uh, people living in a certain uh, epoch, we are rather impatient with history and with other cultures as well as our own. And we do not realize how slow transformations in ideology and thought take place. I go back again, now that I've emphasized the fact that there are these two counter-traditions, and now that I've emphasized the fact that Islam as a system is fairly young, uh, while Christianity must, could be seen as has reached uh, middle age, Islam would be seen as have reaching youth. And uh, if we were entirely patient and if we lived forever, we'd wait another 600 years, but I'm sure we, most of us aren't. Uh, then we go back to the question, is Islam compatible? 
and here I end as I started. It is an issue of the exclusive right of definition. Who has the right to define this tradition and the text? Who has the right to interpret what it says? In my view, I think it is the right of a Muslim, an exclusive right to define that tradition, as well as the right of a Jew, an exclusive right to define the halakha or the Talmud, and as well as the exclusive right of an American to say that the uh, amendment in the Constitution that says there is a right to bear arms doesn't really mean that. That's an issue of the power of definition. There is enough richness and diversity in Islamic tradition to sustain a variety of positions, and it's really up to Muslims on how they're going to choose to define their tradition. And what they're going to do with their culture and their legacy. In my own research, uh, hadith is the uh, sayings attributed to the Prophet of Islam. Uh, they're called hadith. And in my own research, I found that there are literally hundreds of thousands of hadith of such sayings. And when I've conducted some research to see the percentage of that literature that is used in public discourse among Muslims, I found that it ranges about 5 to 6 percent of the hundreds of thousands of hadith. And furthermore, I found that there is a great disparity between the types of hadith cited, let's say, in Saudi Arabia as compared to the types of hadith cited by Muslims in the United States. And here is a very innovative and creative process of selection and interpretation that I think is admirable. We have to be, and I will end on that note, that we have to be very careful on how we react to the Muslim self-assertion of the power of self-definition. It is not easy for most people to recognize the rights of others to define their culture as we define ours. And we have had a rather difficult history uh, with accepting the idea of political activism in Islam. When a, uh, a rather extremely westernized uh, Tunisian diplomat at the beginning of the century Begin, actually the end of the last century, called Khair al-Din al-Tunisi, who wrote a book calling upon fellow Tunisians to become democratic and emphasizing the virtues of democracy and eventually became the Minister of Finance in Tunisia before the French came in and uh, started implementing what we would call free market and liberal principles. When the French occupied Tunisia, one of the first things they've done is that they removed Khair al-Din al-Tunisi and labeled him a Muslim extremist, citing different parts of his book in which he praises Islam. This type of reaction to Muslim political activism, rather, if, if we give them the benefit of the doubt, rather undistinguishing reaction. He's a Muslim activist, then that by definition must mean that this is a Muslim ext extremist, which by definition means that the, it's a Muslim fundamentalist, which by definition means it's a Muslim uh, uh, a totalitarian person or di dictator, must end because it is really nonsensical in its most essential form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Al-Fadl, for that enlightening presentation. And now, this is the time for your questions and answers. Uh, your questions and our answers, not vice versa. Uh, so, please, ushers, there are some questions there, if you can bring them up to the front. Uh, while we have some time, however, why don't I ask you some of the questions that came up in the last session that uh, applies to your discussion. Please talk about the difference between the Islamic religion and liberation and Islamic State governments? I have to admit I don't understand the question. Why don't I rephrase it then? Please, uh, the question is about the distinction between Islam, the religion, 
and the process of liberation and the contemporary state governments today that call themselves Islamic. This is uh, w what I would say. It is sufficient for me to recognize and respect the right of a Muslim to refuse to accept such and such nation as representing Islam, as not representing him or her and their own convictions and understandings. I am sure there are some Muslims that consider Saudi Arabia as representing their own understanding of Islam. And I'm sure there are some Muslims who consider Iran as representing their own understandings of Islam. And I'm also sure, as I'm probably by um, the, most of the people here, or the, at least the organizers, who believe that none of them represent their understanding of Islam. The essential point is that we have to respect the right of each to come to that determination. And then after respect, all else comes. Okay. How does the provision for state government structure in Islam, much more so than in Christianity, affect the development of democracy in Islamic nations? That's an interesting question. Um, you would be surprised that in Islam, there is no greater degree of explicitness about how the state structure should be as opposed to Christianity. In Islam, there are a few verses in the Quran about uh, government should be conducted by consultation. And that's really basically it. Uh, that's really basically what the Quran says. Uh, other than that, then Muslim writers, jurists throughout history developed different conceptions of how they thought this government should be structured, particularly based on the time where the prophet of Islam ruled his own city in Medina and so on, and then extracted certain principles from it. Of course, because of the, the, the rather, I mean, it's only 1400 years old, so it's not that ancient, there were, an, uh, uh, there were a lot more people who remembered more things about that government and consequently, we've received more traditions. Now, in the case of Christianity, you do find, if you read uh, medieval literature uh, before uh, the Reformation and so on, you do find a lot of writings of law, basically, about how a government of God should be. Before St. Augustine, uh, the, about how the, gov the, the city of God should be. And it is not, it is different in substance and emphasis, but not different in mass than the Islamic tradition. Is the death sentence imposed on author Rushdi consistent with Islamic theory and teachings? If not, is there any vocal opposition to such extremism within the Muslim community? Uh, this question, of course, should be directed to, to a mufti. Uh, an, an Islamic um, uh, leader of, 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 a, of a, or an Islamic leader of a mosque, but I, I, let me wear the robes of a mufti just for two minutes and, and say something that will probably uh, no one will like. Uh, Since we don't have a mufti here, I guess you'll do. <laughs> uh, um, does it um, is it inevitable in Islamic tradition? Absolutely not. It's not inevitable because, in fact, I've, had, I've just published a recent article on that, on the issue of jurisdiction in Islamic law. And in, traditionally, throughout, uh, ranging from about 600 to 800 years ago, there arose the vast debate among Muslim jurists as to whether Islamic law can be applied anywhere outside of Islamic territory. Now, and there, there has been no consensus ever since. That's one. Two. There has been a vast debate among Muslim jurists as to whether someone who is accused of blaspheming the Prophet uh, uh, can be executed. And it, what is really surprising is that they created distinctions between blaspheme, blaspheming the Prophet, blaspheming Islam, blaspheming God, blaspheming the Quran, and you cannot predict the position of one jurist 
by, uh, by studying only his position on one issue. So even that, there is no consensus on it. Now, as to whether Muslims uh, um, oppose or, or resisted it or whatever, yes, I've, I mean, I've seen uh, quite a few Muslims who have. One of them is this mosque, as I I've, I've remember reading, uh, and uh, in a previous visit when I've talked to some people here, that they were very upset about that. And they, in fact, I remember talking to uh, um, one of the, the, the founders of this mosque, and, they, and he told me that he doesn't even think that the book should be banned, because in Islam there is no support for the idea of banning. And not only here, but also in New Jersey, I've, I've, I've seen a demonstration that uh, was, and se heard several radio uh, interviews on the Christian Science Matter, so definitely yes. Is not Islam's current concern vis-a-vis religious belief and practice also being challenged by its now close contact with quote-unquote Western religious and social tradition. In the past, such contacts involved Islamic hegemony over Jewish or non-Islamic people. Um, again, I, I have an extreme problem with, with just this uh, phrasing the issue of doesn't Islam uh, what's that uh, someone has to be much more explicit and particular and careful this is exactly uh, the, equ the, the equivalent of saying doesn't America America is formed of Republican Democrats um, a lot of crazy people a lot of sane people a lot of liberal people a lot of conservative people or doesn't Judaism and there are a lot of schools of thought, but anyway, going beyond my, my initial extreme discomfort with the, the way the question is posed, no, Islam did not have uh, an uninterrupted history of hegemony. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of books on that. I mean, anyone who really wants to read up on it, there, there has been various interactions throughout Islamic history. Some of them based on cultural exchange, some of them based on war, some of them based on trade. Uh, definitely in areas like China and uh, India and uh, a lot of Africa, there was no uh, large-scale military conflicts. It was mostly trade and so on. Uh, in, in vast epochs, we have a lot of evidence of Muslim ambassadors and, and the political envoys going to the West and receiving envoys from the West and so on. So this, the question is too fundamentalist to uh, be accurate. Uh, given your time frame, that is Christianity took 2,000 years to achieve liberal secular democracy, should we expect equivalent of the Magna Carta from the Muslim world soon? <laughs> Since the Magna Carta was way before. Well, everyone knows that, you know, if, uh, if a doctor is dealing with a patient, and especially a patient who has something other than a common uh, medical problem, if you are going to sit there and expect the patient to to just go through all the, the symptoms and check them off as they go, you'll probably be a very bad doctor. And then you'll probably sued by a lawyer, which um, is good for me. Um, uh, you can't deal with history that way. Uh, the, the point is the rather long breath of history. And that was the point that I'm trying to emphasize. I, or I think I've, I've actually stole this idea from Mohsen Mahdi, who's a professor at Harvard University. Uh, so due credit must be given to him. Uh, but the, the main emphasis is the long breadth of history and the fact that religions, systems develop in their own unique and peculiar way. And no, we, we cannot expect anything as definite as the Magna Carta, and I really do not know uh, what is going to happen to Islam or Muslims 600 years from now. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for other questions, but as you can tell, we're willing to take uh, any question from the audience and are very happy to answer it with, with our perspectives. Dr. Abul Fadl, thank you very much for being available for us today and giving, you, giving us your scholarly perspective on this very important topic.
We're going to begin our third session today for the seminar, Islam Beyond the Stereotypes. And this session is entitled, Building New Paradigms. And seeing that he, here in America, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and other people live in a free society, it is time to consider building the relationships from America and not being dictated by the relationships from overseas. I guess that, <laughs> that sounds good to somebody here. <laughs> So we have two distinguished spokespersons today, a leader in the Muslim community and a congressman in the Los Angeles area to talk about these issues. Our first speaker is the chairman of the Islamic Center of Southern California. His name is Dr. Mara Hatut, and he's a doctor because he practices cardiology in the Los Angeles area. And some people wonder if his full-time work is at the Islamic Center or at his office uh, medical office because he spends so much time with not only Muslim activities but interfaith dialogue and interfaith development. He has been an art articulate spokesman for Muslim views and a bridge for better understanding among various groups. Dr. Hatut serves as an advisor to many national Muslim organizations such as Multivera International, the Minaret Magazine, the American Muslim Council, and the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Many of the effective organizations you see today working to improve the relationships between Muslims and other people originated from his thinking and his planning. He is an inspiration for many Muslim activists. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please welcome Dr. Maher Hatut. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, most compassionate, most merciful, thank you, Salam, for a very nice introduction, which I seldom get in this place unless we have guests. <laughs> so I'll give you my schedule and please stop by every now and then. <clears throat> uh, I am, I'm glad that uh, Salam mentioned that I am a physician because lots of people don't believe that. And I thought I jump on the opportunity and try to prove it. So to the horror of the organizers, I'll be speaking medicine. <laughs> then we'll try to link medicine to the topic we are talking about. Uh, then uh, I'll give you the fees of my clinic and, you know, <laughs> and things like that. Um, uh, one of the brilliant new techniques in medicine is uh, a technique that we call tagging. And tagging is to put a tag on the cells. And then you develop antibodies against the tag. So the antibodies can attack the tag and hence kill the cell. Uh, that's enough for medicine. Uh, I feel that the word fundamentalism is used as a, as a tag. You tag Islamic or Muslims or Islam with the word fundamentalism and then the antibodies and the allergic reactions that have developed in this country in particular against fundamentalism will go and attack the tag and uh, uh, whether willingly or unwillingly will, will kill the cell. Which is uh, something that is of great concern of course to us uh, Muslims in America and of great concern to the truth lovers, no matter what their persuasion is. Uh, <clears throat> it is not becoming in America to attack a religion. It's not, it is not the in thing to do. But if you attack the tag, that comes very handy. And so we find under that tag, Islamic fundamentalism, Islam became a free game for those who shoot at it. And my job today is to try in a, in a rather constructive way, and, and one thing I may promise in this forum is, uh, is honesty and candor, to try to question uh, whether this tag belongs or not. As we know, the term fundamentalism is, uh, is a term that is describing uh, a movement uh, of literalism which uh, occurred within the Protestant Christianity in America. 
uh, it was as a reaction to liberal interpretation of the Bible, as a reaction to the reform. It uh, probably reached its peaks, its peak in uh, the 1920s. Uh, it, it became so powerful in certain southern states uh, of the United States. Uh, in, in, the, in the year uh, 1925, uh, the movement could ban in, uh, in uh, Mississippi and then in Tennessee the right of instruction about evolution in public schools. So it must have been a, a strong trend in America. And uh, there is a famous case, I wish if the lawyers were here, because I'm not very good at remembering the names of the cases. It is always something versus something. Uh, uh, in, in that case was somebody versus the state of Tennessee, uh, who was, who was uh, an instructor who insisted to teach uh, scopes. Okay, bill me later. Uh, uh, that uh, that really this man challenged the the situation. The the movement uh, plateaued, then uh, declined. Uh, whether it is right or wrong, whether that's bad movement or good movement, this is not my topic and is not my concern. But defi definitely, it developed a lot of antibodies within mainstream America. And when the word fundamentalism is mentioned, there is a certain mental and psychological process that takes place to, to tag those people, to target these cells, and to, uh, a situation becomes very problematic. Uh, to, to us, the situation is even more ironic, because that word in particular, never existed in 1400 years of history of Islamic literature. It is an unknown term. And when it was translated into Arabic, it was translated by Muhammad Hassanin Haikal, the chief editor of Al-Ahram paper, and he translated it wrong. And the word in Arabic, is, is is being used now, quoting, started by quoting American sources, until it is adopted now by the Egyptian government to feel free to kill some people that it doesn't like. Uh, but the, the term itself is strange, is, a, is an odd term, is an alien term. There was no such a movement in the history of Islam. Uh, I, I can talk and I can quote Khaled later on on different movements, but none of them uh, did fit the description and the qualification of a fundamentalist movement. The, for the situation to become more sad, I would say, if I take the word literally, which means to go to the fundamentals of the religion, to the basics of the religion, i.e. to go to the fundamental understanding, unadulterated reading of the Quran that we consider the, the word of God and of the authentic teachings of Muhammad, that means automatically to shed off the impact of traditions, the impact of restrictive fatwas, which are rulings. You'll find the definition in your booklets. The impact of rigid interpretations of interpretations of historicity to feel free to receive the wisdom of God and implement it uh, in a new context that's changing according to time and according to place. And based on that, all the movements of revivalism that happened in the history of Islam were, by definition, fundamentalist movements i.e. telling the scholars, the muftis, the mullahs, the ayatollahs, etc., excuse us, what you say is not binding, we will go to the source. And hence to me, as a Muslim, if I become fundamentalist, 
this should dictate a certain degree of open-mindedness, of tolerance, of accepting that there is no one infallible other than God, in accepting the word of God, which is diversity as his way of creating, etc., etc. There are uh, other, uh, there are specific examples from the Quran that I can quote, probably in the QA session, so that I don't uh, ex exhaust uh, the time allocated to me in, in giving specific examples. But the point I'm trying to make is we have a term that's coined somewhere else to describe a situation, and that term is, is being now applied to a group of people or activities or institutions or parties or, what, or countries that are totally oblivion to the meaning of that term in the Western context. And the sad state of affairs, and uh, we, we, we can't understand how strong our power of suggestion is here from America that this term is being accepted as ipso facto in the Muslim circles and cycles and they use it. They use it and when you ask anybody what do you mean by it, he, he, he cannot give you an answer. And as a matter of fact here in America, and I attended so many seminars and conferences by so many respectable scholars that talked about fundamentalism and when I asked what do you mean by Islamic fundamentalism? How can you back your definition by Islamic sources? You don't find it, and you find exactly what uh, uh, Khaled Abul Fadl mentioned, that we deprive the people of the right of defining their own selves. We define them and give them a description that, uh, that, they, don't, uh, that they don't condone. Uh, uh, it's not only from uh, word jihad, for example. It is across the board translated as holy war. And I look in Islamic literature since Muhammad up till now to find any indication that a war can be holy. And I don't find anything. It is a translation that is coined here to describe a situation emerged from the Crusades and it is implemented to a situation and it becomes so popular to the point that one of the sons of our uh, probably audience here, his name was Jihad. And he, when he wanted to get his car license and he wanted to put on the plate his, his name, the uh, department refused on basis of offending the public. Uh, so we really have to, to revisit and to re-question our definitions and the right of the other to define him or herself the way, they, the way that they believe in. The, the funny part also is that definition or this tag, to prove that it is tag, to prove that medicine is correct, is describing things that no one in the wildest imagination could have ever been able to lump them together. It describes Saudi Arabia as well as Iran, Sudan, as well as Omar Abdurrahman in New Jersey, it describes Ikhwan Muslimin in Egypt who have been building hospitals and schools for two decades with the groups that advocate violence. It describes uh, Ghanoushi of uh, Tunisia, who is the preacher of democracy and the pluralism, and lump him together with uh, uh, the wing of the movement in Algeria that have a different idea, etc. It is a tag. And when I tried, uh, to, to, to act smart and to try to find what is the common denomination from the point of view of the Western writer vis-a-vis -vis the point of view of those other people who don't know the term that's describing them, I find that from the other side, uh, the only thing that can probably put those people together, probably, not even all of them, is they want to assert themselves in the world as Muslims in different ways. Some of them take ways that meet our approval. Some of them take ways that might be dangerous or whatever. But they wanted to assert themselves as members of the, of the world club as Muslims. They don't want to be required to shed off their Islam to belong. 
And I admire the question that came in the previous session, why don't Muslims join hands with uh, Christians and Jews, which, which is a, a good question. I think uh, the way As uh, Aslam Abdullah responded is very good way. I just add to it, why don't Christians and Jews accept Muslims to join hands with them? Uh, case at point is the term Judeo Christian society, which is, uh, can't be, no one can be serious and coin such a term. Uh, Judeo Christian cannot be Judeo Christian unless it is Judeo Christian Islamic or Abrahamic or monotheistic religions. But Judeo Christian have nothing in common except the exclusion of Muslims. It only means that. It's only telling me, excuse us, you are not a member. Because we are Western religions. As if Jesus Christ has been born in Bronx. <laughs> or Moses in Paris. <laughs> but you are Eastern religion. And we find that again and again and again. I think, I think time is, uh, is ripe for us to uh, very carefully assess our, uh, our situations and the question our terms and our definitions. Um, I have a Jewish friend who, who wrote to me. I was hoping to see him today, uh, writing to me uh, in, in, uh, in a discussion in, on, which, on a topic on which, on which we disagree in a civilized way and in a friendly way, that he says we belong to traditions in which the selection of terms have great significance. And I, I say amen. That's true. Our selection of words have... Uh, ...to describe Islamic institutions, people, activities, good or bad, in my judgment, is wrong. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Hatut, for that eye-opener, as usual, giving us an enlightening message that's important to all of us Americans. Before I go on to our next speaker, uh, our guest speaker today, I just received a letter from Congresswoman Lucille Royball Allard, who was planning to make it today but could not, so she sent a letter, and I, I feel obliged. the seminar on Islam. Due to prior commitments, I regret that I cannot join you today at this important educational forum. I congratulate the Muslim Public Affairs Council for undertaking the important task of educating the public on the issues involving Islam. As a legislator with the responsibility of creating policies that affect the American public, I cannot stress enough the importance of accessible, complete, and accurate information. Our world today requires nations to work with each other. As a major religion for one-fifth of the world population, the understanding of Islam is critical to help the United States foster closer ties with more nations and to allow elected officials to better address the needs of all Americans. My office is open to you for assistance and information. I look forward to hearing about issues that concern and affect the Muslim American community. Sincerely, Lucille Royval Allard, Member of Congress. Thank you. Our next speaker is a congressman who has served his district since 1982. He's in the Los Angeles area. He now serves as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He chairs the Subcommittee on International Operations. He's on the Judiciary Committee and the Budget Committee. He is a co-founder with California Representative Henry Waxman of a highly successful democratic political organization in western Los Angeles County. It's called the Berman Waxman Organization, and it dominates many of the issues involving the West Los Angeles political scene. The way we met with Congressman Howard Berman is by lobbying for Bosnia and asking some of his constituents to go and meet with him. And from that meeting, we, we not only struck an agreement on the Balkan crisis, but we also struck an agreement to continue the dialogue for so many, so many other important issues. Especially 
on issues involving Jewish-Muslim relations. And I believe we were impressed with his office and his staff and their sensitivity and their concern and the forthcomingness. And we were also impressed very much with him. And I hope that he was impressed with us, <laughs> as is evident by his appearance today. His topic is Muslims through the eyes of a congressman. Please welcome the congressman, the honorable Howard Berman. Thank you very much, Salam, and uh, I think, Dr. Atu, you have, uh, I don't know what other stereotypes will be uh, busted up today, but you certainly have busted up the stereotype of a medical, of the medical profession as a group <laughs> focused uh, narrowly on the issues of the biological sciences, uh, both from our meeting in my district office and, and now uh, your interests and knowledge are, are wide and deep, and I'm honored uh, that you invited me to be here today and have a chance to speak. Because uh, I, I, I want to participate uh, in an effort to move uh, America beyond what I view as the unjust and false stereotypes of Islam that are hurled at us on a nearly daily basis. I come before you as a concerned American and a member of Congress from the Eastern San Fernando Valley, a district undoubtedly containing many people of the Islamic faith. But I am also coming to you as a Jew and as a Zionist, a devout believer in the importance of Israel's existence as a Jewish homeland and its survival and its security. I point this out, uh, and anybody who knows me probably already knew it anyway, but I point it out simply because that belief uh, stems in large part from being a member of a group which has suffered enormously as a result of bigotry, intolerance, and stereotyping for many centuries. And as I'll try to show today, uh, I fear that a similar atmosphere of hate, intolerance, and racism is being fostered about Islam here in America today. Let me raise three propositions that are obvious to this audience and should be obvious to everyone, but nevertheless need to be said. The first is that Islam is one of the three great monotheistic religions of the world with a system of religious law and morality that is the equal of and in many ways similar to the other two, Christianity and Judaism. All three share the same God, all three hold human life precious, and all three set standards of behavior that if they were ever met would lead their followers to live righteous lives. The second proposition is that the overwhelming majority of Muslims around the world are neither terrorists nor oil sheiks, but rather ordinary human beings struggling to feed and educate their children just like all the rest of us. The third proposition is that it is simply false to assert, as many do, that there is an inherent and inevitable conflict between Islam and the West, between Islamic values and Western values. I must tell you, I hear this latter assertion constantly from some of the most sophisticated, in quotes, analysts in Washington. It's all well and good to promote democracy as a cornerstone of American foreign policy, they'll say. But are you really prepared to deal with the extremism and radicalism that democratic institutions will bring to the Islamic world? Or, with equal disdain, they will declare Islam fundamentally incompatible with respect and regard for human rights? In so doing, these Western analysts serve the purposes of authoritarian and despotic regimes by cloaking acceptance of the status quo as the inevitable uh, political, political manifestation of Islam. Those who assert such notions forget that it took the West 500 years to reach a still tenuous belief in democracy and human rights, a very bloody 500 years, marked by religious and racial intolerance, and culminating this century in the most unspeakable horror in human history, perpetrated by the very model of a, quote, Western civilized, unquote, society, Germany. They forget the acts of terrorism and violence that continue in the West, in such places as Northern Ireland, recently in Italy, and in Bosnia, to name only a few. These are not conducted by Muslims. Indeed, in Bosnia, Muslim, Muslims are the victims. They forget the people who make these assertions. They forget all that, but they expect that the Muslim world to reach in one jump and without turmoil and upheaval what took the West 20 generations and is still incomplete. 
I think it would be terribly wrong to accept the proposition that Muslim nations that now live under dictatorships or oligarchies are forever doomed to that fate. The fall of communism teaches us that political systems dominated by a ruling elite accountable only to themselves cannot survive indefinitely. Contrary to a perception popular in many quarters, the Islamic religion is not the antithesis and automatic enemy of democracy. I want to spend a few minutes just touching on uh, the, ter the, the point about Islamic fundamentalism that Dr. Hattut made. As he said, the term fundamentalism is a borrowed term, originally applied to Christians who believe that everything written in the Bible is literally true, and who by and large hold very conservative political and social views. Its transposition to Islam, however, is misapplied and has become synonymous with terrorism. It is as if deeply religious Muslims are more prone to violence and terrorism than are deeply religious Christians or Jews, or are somehow instructed by Islam to conduct such acts. Indeed, all three religions, all three religions, and for that matter, other religions and ideologies, have their fringe elements. One need look no further than David Koresh or Meyer Kahana to discover men who, in the name of their religions, fostered actions and beliefs antithetical to those religions. Yet although in the Western mass media, Koresh and Kahana are portrayed as fringe extremists beyond the pale, Violence and terrorism are portrayed as the norm of the so-called Islamic fundamentalists. And Islam itself is seen fostering such beliefs and acts. It tarnishes all Islam and all Muslims with a broad brush, making Muslims the, the boogeymen of the contemporary Western world. This monolithic view of Islam is, of course, a great distortion. It ignores the huge diversity within the Islamic world and within the religion itself. States with Muslim majorities range from the largely democratic and secular uh, Turkey to the relatively free-willing society of Egypt to the theocracies of Iran and Saudi Arabia to the military-dominated states of Syria, Algeria, and Indonesia. There is not a whole lot that these states have in common. This view ignores the struggle within Islam to come to terms with the modern world. It ignores, for example, the work of scholars at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, the greatest school of Islam in the world, who since the end of the last century have developed in a way, innovative ways to reconcile Islam and modernity. It ignores democratic movements in Turkey, in Pakistan, even in Jordan. The real struggle, thus, is between those who recognize universal values and those who don't, in whatever group they are found. The struggle exists in Islam, it exists here in America, it exists around the world. Nevertheless, as a result of the media hysteria about Islam, an atmosphere of hate, intolerance, and racism is fostered here at home. It feeds discrimination, and I suspect also it feeds hate crimes. Such bigotry towards any group demeans us as a society, reduces our freedoms, and injures our most sacred belief in democracy and human rights. I started this talk as an American Jewish congressman. I do believe that Jews and Muslims must join in common cause to fight these attitudes. I know that that is starting to happen here in Los Angeles, but we should work to expand its scope, both locally and nationally. It is right to do not only for our own sakes, but for our country's sake as well. We must work together in this fight. I want to just make two final points. First, the concerning role as American Muslims. I believe you have the obligation not only to raise your profile here, but to serve as a bridge between America and the Islamic world, both to foster better understanding between the two and to join the struggle in the Islamic world in its efforts to come to terms with universal human values and human rights. As many of you know, I have long advocated ending the arms embargo and coupling that with the use of NATO airstrikes. Although President Clinton agrees, we have failed to convince our European allies. Perhaps belatedly, this is starting to change. That it did not happen sooner is also a tra uh, and uh, a tragedy that uh, that will be with us for a long time. I want to thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to any questions you may have. And uh, again, I repeat what I said at the beginning: it's an honor to to be able to share the podium with you and to uh, to come to the Islamic Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Questions to Dr. Hatut. How do you reconcile historic persecutions of Jews based on the teaching of Muhammad and the Quran with contemporary efforts of Muslims and Jews to coexist? The <clears throat> the question is uh, is a model of the assumptions 
that need to be questioned. It is, it reminds me uh, by asking a man, do you, do you beat your wife three times or five times a week? The assumption is that there is a process of beating. I think uh, the Islamic Jewish history is like any history between two groups. Uh, it has its ups and downs. The teaching of the Quran is those who do not fight us to change our religion, and I'm quoting verbatim, or to drive us out of our homes. The recommendation of God is to deal with them with nicety and justice. Not justice alone and not nicety alone. Uh, the Islamic Jewish history, based on the Quranic uh, instruction, was a history of cooperation and recognition. And I would uh, proudly so say that the first human incidents where pluralism of religion was accepted in a country ruled by a religion was in Medina led by Muhammad, peace and the blessing of God be upon him, who wrote a treaty with the Jews saying, and the Jews are a nation like ours, they have their rights and they have their obligations and they conduct their affairs according to the Torah. And this is in human history is unprecedented because in a world that was ruled by religions, it was always one religion prevails, even in ancient Egypt. Though when the worship of the sun comes, the worship of the moon goes. Uh, even in Spain, when Catholicism comes, means that Protestants as well as Jews or Muslims are out and so on and so forth. But the, the Islamic model in its purity did not have a specific problem with the Jews. As history developed, there were periods where they fought, there were periods where Jews seek refuge and safe haven under Islamdom, like in Spain. Remember that the Maimonides were written in Arabic, then translated, and like in the Ottoman, where the Jews who migrated from Spain could land in the Ottoman Empire for safety and to maintain their religiosity as Jewish people. So the, we cannot abstract from the history that Islam has an inherent animosity towards Judaism or towards Christianity for that matter. There were political and socio-economic upheavals, but I think that the history in, in general was more of a history of tolerance and uh, I don't mean to talk negatively about anybody. I believe that history belongs to its people anyways. I mean, past is past. However, if we look to the Islamic Jewish relations vis-a-vis -vis the Christian Jewish relations, we'll find that Islam will shine and we don't hear this argument addressed to Christianity. We always hear it addressed to Islam. And this is why I am very, I was, I expressed my very critical attitude towards Judeo-Christian terminology. Okay. Question to Representative Berman. The struggling human rights and peace movements in Israel get scant support from organized U.S. Jewry and Jewish members of Congress. What is your position on the Israeli violations and atrocities like the recent action against Lebanon? Well, uh, this again reminds me of the question of do you beat your wife three times or five times? Uh, but Probably five. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that I accept <laughs> some of the terms uh, that are assumed in the in the question. Uh, my own my own belief, uh, and if we're getting into uh, a discussion of uh, of of Israel, my belief very much is that just as I want a Jewish homeland, I want a democracy, uh, and you cannot have a Jewish homeland and a democracy and be a perpetual occupier of large numbers of people who are denied uh, their civil rights and their civil liberties or their ability to participate. You lose one facet or the other. Um, I, 
I also have a deep belief that, uh, and I guess all recent history uh, may want to point in another direction, but I couldn't be in politics if I weren't an optimist. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, the peace process uh, uh, will can can bring a just result uh, to this conflict and a place for uh, uh, Jews and Arabs with uh, and but be they Christian or or Muslim uh, in this area of the world where. They all have uh, uh, fundamental rights uh, and, and a right to participate in their own uh, self-government. Uh, when you get into the issue of the specific Lebanon campaign, and then I come back and I talk about the, uh, uh, the shelling of uh, civilian communities in northern Israel, uh, uh, we, can, we can have a discussion and a debate about that. I think it, it, it narrows the focus of, of this particular discussion. Uh, I, am, I do believe, again, uh, that uh, the good and the bad in all religions and in all governments exists and that uh, it's right to point them out and uh, there undoubtedly have been abuses and overreactions uh, 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 by Israeli government and Israeli ar armed forces at all, uh, all times since 1948 uh, just as there have been serious provocations and actions needed to be taken by Israel to preserve its own uh, country. I will uh, take the opportunity to fulfill a promise that I promised. Uh, Rabbi Alf Alfred Wolf is here. He left. Oh, so I don't have to fulfill the promise then. Uh, anyways, I, there was uh, there was a no <laughs> nothing I said. There was a communication between myself and the rabbi. He was feeling uncomfortable about the letter I published in the LA Times. Uh, about uh, bombing Lebanon, where, of course, I, I, I bitterly uh, protested the bombing of uh, Lebanon and uh, uh, causing 500,000 people to be homeless within three days. I used the expression ethnic cleansing, and uh, the rabbi uh, was concerned about the expression, uh, which I, I agree with his concern, and um, my response to him was I was talking technically, not ideologically, and by no means I wanted to equate what uh, the bombing of South Lebanon is to what is taking place in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the rabbi told me that, now you told me that over the phone, how about those who read your letter, I promised that we will have a forum where media will be attending, and I announced that I disagree on bombing Lebanon vehemently. I don't equate what happened to the atrocities of the Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I do that for the sake of honesty and for a promise I, I have to fulfill. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Hatut, if those labeled fundamentalists are not fundamentalist, then what term would you use? Uh, for example, what about, would you apply to those terms who believe that religious laws should govern secular governments and those who bombed the World Trade Center and those who want Salman Rushdie to be killed? Let me take the last part of the question first. It's an easier way. Uh, by the way, in uh, the question was asked about Salman Rushdie and how come there was no vocal opposition to the fatwa. And this not only not only a, a point of intrigue to me, but really a point of uh, of some sadness, because it shows me that people are have selective deafness. They hear only what they want to hear. Every major Islamic organization in America or in the world did protest and condemn the fatwa of Khomeini to execute Salman Rushdie. This center did. I was on the four channels of TV in all the papers and Al-Azhar University and the Dar al-Ifta of Saudi Arabia. And these are organizations that I'm not very fond of. And, and uh, the, the different religious organizations uh, Islamic Society of North America, etc. All of them condemned the fatwa. And without exception, 
in every place I go, how come you didn't condemn the fatwa? No, we did, but some people only wanted to hear what will make us look funny and weird, not what will make us look sen uh, sound sensible. So the fatwa is condemned. That's the last part of the question. Now I forgot the first part of the question. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what term would you use rather than... Yeah, that also, as a matter of fact, I included it in my talk, then I excluded it. Uh, now it is haunting me again. Because people, when I go to talk, they say, so you don't want to call them fundamentalism. What do you want to call them? It's your problem. It's really your problem. I don't have to do the work for you. Uh, call them whatever you like. Uh, I, uh, uh, one, you want suggestions? Call them people who are doing something wrong. We didn't say that uh, skinheads are uh, the fundamentalist followers of the church of the creator. We didn't say that. We didn't say a Protestant tried to shoot Reagan. We said John Hinckley tried to shoot Reagan. Those people have names, by the way. Say, Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So and so and yes, and did, did that awful thing. But you want to call them whatever you want. It's a free country. I, I will not do the work for you anyways. Um, I'm, life is too short. Uh, 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 the third part, you, you, the I covered. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> After all, Aslam Abdullah said that we built the thing, so we can blow it up. <laughs> Congressman Berman, on another topic, being on the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, what is your stand on the Kashmir issue, which is another Bosnia in East Asia? Uh, it, well, to want to come here, one has to become a, a real expert on a lot, uh, a lot of the of the world. And, uh, uh, the one thing I know is that uh, what was promised in Kashmir it never happened. Uh, I know there are a lot of charges back and forth between uh, Hindus and uh, Muslims, but or between uh, Kashmiris and Indians uh, uh, as to why that didn't happen. I know that there have been a large number of abuses by uh, by. Uh, law enforcement uh, authorities and local brigades in Kashmir uh, responsive uh, uh, to the Indian national government, although uh, when I, I met with the Indian ambassador uh, just a, f a couple of months ago and he made, a very, he made a very passionate case that in many of situations this is done, uh, this is freelance operations, uh, not, not done with the uh, consent or the authorization or with the condoning of the Indian government. Uh, I also know that uh, there are movements in Kashmir uh, to, uh, to uh, in effect, uh, take its fate into people's own hands, uh, acts of, uh, of terrorism and disruption that uh, create uh, uh, situations that uh, lead to uh, violent confrontations. Uh, uh, but going back to my original comment, uh, uh, I think uh, the Kashmiris have a, a right in the end to the self-determination process that was promised them back in 1948, 49, and 1950. Dr. Hartut, for almost all types of Jews, the existence and continued relationship between Jews and the State of Israel is an integral part and fundamental principle of religious belief and personal commitment. It is therefore essential for Jews to hear and understand how Muslims feel and what Islam teaches today about Israel. What is your position? What Islam teaches today about Israel, of course, you are aware that Israel has been created 1948, while Islam has been uh, there uh, 1400 years before that. So it, uh, it will not, uh, I will not open the Quran and say, hear what the Quran says about the Knesset or about the state of Israel. Uh, we, we will not find anything like that. Uh, we will find the principles that uh, human life is sacred, that uh, God bestowed dignity on the progeny of Adam, regardless of race, color, or creed. We will find the statements that people should not be pushed out of their lands or coerced in matters of their religion. And uh, hence, taking these principles, we will deal politically with the situation in Israel. 
And uh, if you want my personal opinion, uh, Israel is a reality of life, and we can uh, have it as a bloody reality that we keep killing each other, or we, we accept a peaceful coexistence. Uh, this will depend, of course, on, on all the parties. And there is certain complexity uh, on the issue that needs to be addressed. But uh, we, we are not in the business of dismantling states. Uh, and we are not also in the business of saying the Palestinian people never existed, they don't exist, they have no rights. I feel that uh, the Israel did exist, whether we like it or not. It did exist, it does exist, and it will. And it is only smart to uh, be constructive in the relationship uh, with, that, with, the, with the entity of the, the state of Israel about the feeling of the Jewish people towards the state uh, of course, I, I can understand it very clearly, and uh, I, I, I have no objection of conscience even about that. But uh, the Palestinian rights to me are very sacred and are very dear, and I feel that uh, if we argue for the rights of uh, the Jews to, to hold dearly to the state of Israel, we should also accept the right of the Palestinians to have their own sovereign state uh, next to Israel. The argument that this will be a dangerous state to me is one of the lousiest arguments in political history because it goes both ways, but also Israel will be dangerous to that state. And uh, the states that uh, live with common borders, they always, along the history, found that the best way is to find a solution to live in peace, and this will happen here also. Congressman Berman, I appreciate your words about the warnings against the fe uh, stereotypes about Islam. Unfortunately, Benjamin Netanyahu wrote in his recent book about Israel that Islamic fundamentalism is the new danger to the West and that Israel is defending the United States from Islamic fundamentalism. What is your opinion about his comments? This will not be the first time that I disagree with uh, Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, you know, I had a... You know, I had a, a, a long debate with... It occurred a lot within the pro-Israel Jewish community uh, during the Cold War, and especially in the 80s, when it was fashionable to argue Israel's existence and the reason why people should support Israel was because it was a bulwark against uh, imperialist, expansionist uh, communism uh, uh, and was a, a fortress for America and that this was the first and last argument uh, of why uh, the American people and the American government should support Israel. Uh, I find myself having the same negative reaction to the argument that uh, Israel should be supported because it is uh, it is the bulwark against this uh, this uh, dangerous uh, Islamic movement uh, that exists and that will undo all uh, Western values. I think, and uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, uh, there are. There are many good ones to support uh, uh, Israel. I don't need to go to uh, negative kinds of arguments that lump all kinds of groups, as I spoke to in my speech, uh, together uh, in a disparaging term in order to justify that support. And uh, so I, I don't find that argument uh, an appealing one. Dr. Antuda, I'm less concerned about words, terms, and semantics, and more concerned about actions. What is the response to those individuals, who are Muslims, who engage in violence in the name of Islam? An easy way to answer to say is Islam is uh, against violence. And uh, so I, I tell these people, if they are doing that in the name of Islam, they are Islamically wrong. That's number one. Number two, they are doing a great disservice to Islam. However, let me, let me have my conscience clear, but because it is very tempting in an audience, which there are a good number of non-Muslims, is to fall into appeasement. And I, am, I don't want to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want everybody to be angry. 
including myself. Uh, violence is wrong. To, to, to try to insinuate that, that violence is an Islamic phenomena is a joke. Because if Muslims, some of them are violent, they, they are new kids on the block of violence. They are babies. They didn't do Second World War, First World War, they didn't bomb Hiroshima, they didn't kill six million Jews, they didn't uh, make atomic bomb, they didn't kill hundreds of thousands in Vietnam, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. So in, if when it comes to violence, Muslims are babies in the game, I wish they never grow up in it. But they are learning from the masters. So violence is wrong whether it's committed by Muslims, Christians, Jews, or atheists. But let us never try to say that violence is the speciality or the hobby or the skill of Muslims, because this is not true. This question is to Dr. Hatut again. Please define the term infidel and how that is used in divisive ways. Again, the term infidel is a biblical term, not an Islamic term. The term in Islam is kafir, which means a one, it is even close to the English word, who covers, which means the one who covers the truth, uh, which means the one who denies God, or those category of people who elected to cover their belief in Muhammad and the Quran. It does not have to be derogatory. This is why we don't call them the infidels. We call them the kafirs. It means the one who covered that part of Muhammad and they believed in the rest of the message. Do you have any closing comments? Closing comments? Oh, you have a microphone. Uh, The, you mean just generally? No. Yeah, that was the last question. Oh, all, right. Okay. So. all right. Well, I uh, again, I, I look forward to to keeping this dialogue going, to finding projects we can work together on, uh, to uh, playing whatever role I can in uh, in in not in 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 changing this perception uh, that uh, more and more people taking as a result of the way the more tr media has portrayed certain events and uh, maybe i could close by just introducing from my staff who is here two people who when i'm back in washington to the extent there are issues you are concerned about and want to contact me there in my district office one is tom waldman over here uh, and um, and somewhere in this audience is Pearl Ritchie. Uh, there she is. There she is. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. We are honored to have you today. And I think this is probably a monumental event where we have a Jewish congressman and a Muslim leader speaking together about very difficult issues. I think it underscores the point that we were making earlier in this seminar that Muslims, Christians, Jews, and other people